So some words of Torah for us this morning. This morning we read Chaye Sarah, this week's Torah portion, which tells the story of the death of our matriarch Sarah. And it also tells the death, uh, the story of the death of Avraham, our patriarch. But what's really interesting is that the most significant thing that happens in this Parsha is actually, in my opinion, not about either of them. It's not about Sarah or Avraham. So here's what it is. It happens right after we read of Avraham's death. It says, the Torah says, uh, His sons, meaning Avraham's sons, Isaac or Yitzchak and Yishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar, the Hittite facing Mamre. His sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah. If this story detail, the, the detail of two sons standing at the graveside burying their father doesn't seem like the most significant plot point at this time, then I think it's a reflection of the fact that we have not been paying enough attention to its significance. Because in fact, the last time that these two brothers were together, Yitzchak and Yishmael, they were both little children. Sarah was this protective new mother, and she notices Yishmael, who is playing with her son. He's being mitzachek with her son. And we don't know exactly what that means. Maybe laughing, maybe playing, maybe doing something inappropriate, but Sarah is outraged and she instructs Avraham to send Hagar and little Ishmael away. And you might remember what happens. The mother Hagar and the son Ishmael are forced out of the home and they go out into the desert with only a bottle of water and a little bit of bread and they nearly die in the desert. They end up surviving, but they move far away and a whole lifetime passes. And yet somehow at the end of a long painful estrangement between the two, those two boys now grown men are able to stand at the graveside and bury their father together. I'm thinking about this particularly in this moment. In this time of amplified calls for national unity and healing, I am drawn to this image from this week's Parsha. And I wanna ask us to consider how did Ishmael and Yitzchak get there? How did these two brothers get to the graveside after a life of, of dramatic estrangement of seeing the world in totally different ways? So in our Parsha, the Torah explains that Avraham as an old man was blessed by God Bakol. It says, Avraham zakin babi amim, v'adonai barechet Avraham Bakol that God blessed Abraham in everything. And the rabbis tried to understand what does it mean that God blessed him in every way, in everything. And the rabbis in the Talmud and Bava Batra suggest that the reason that the Torah can say that Avraham, an old man, had been blessed with everything is because he was blessed to live long enough to see his son Yishmael repent for his sins in Avraham's own lifetime. Meaning Yishmael, the little boy who played a game with Yitzchak, his little brother, so many years ago, that that sin was a weight that Avram was carrying his entire life. But in his old age, he saw one brother apologize to the other, and that was enough to, to leave him feeling that he had been blessed in every single way. We know and we understand how rifts between siblings can tear parents apart. And my parents have said for many years that that famous saying that you're only as happy as your least happy child. Well, this is along the same lines. When your kids are fighting, there's a kind of heartache that's impossible to, to get beyond. And yet, and yet I find it hard to believe that at the end of Abraham's life, the reason that he feels fulfillment is because Ishmael finally repented because I don't frankly think that whatever Ishmael did to Yitzchak, the baby brother at that time, was quite so terrible that it would merit a lifetime of utter heartache. Now, we don't know. It's possible that it was, but it seems like a stretch. And I think that our narrative leads us to a much more plausible interpretation. But first, we have to take a couple of steps back. So bear with me for a minute, because we are going deep in to the book of Genesis right now. I want to ask you to think for a moment about the trauma of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, which we read about just last Shabbat. The Akedah, when Abraham takes his beloved son Yitzchak, 
walks with him all the way up a mountain, ties him down, and is nearly about to slaughter him as a sacrifice for God when an angel cries out, Abraham, don't do it. Take a ram instead. The trauma caused by the Akedah tears this family apart. When it's all over and Avram and Yitzchak leave the mountain, Avraham goes back to Beersheba. But Sarah, his wife, dies in this parsha in Hebron. Beersheba and Hebron are not next door to each other. These guys were traveling on foot. It's almost a full marathon distance to get from one to the other, meaning Avraham and Sarah become estranged because of whatever happened up on that mountain. They are choosing deliberately not to live in the same neighborhood as one another. And what about Yitzchak? Yitzchak walks up the mountain with his father, but they do not walk down together. In fact, Yitzchak doesn't go down the mountain with his father at all. And he also doesn't go to Hebron to be with his mother, as you might have expected. Even when Sarah dies and is buried in the cave of Machpelah, where Avram buries her, Yitzchak is nowhere to be found. So, so what we see is that this trauma occurs on the mountain and each different person in this family finds a different corner of the land that they're gonna live in for however many years they have left in their lives. Where is Yitzchak? The only indication we have of where Yitzchak goes comes when Rivka, the woman who Yitzchak will marry, is brought into Canaan in this week's Parsha. And Yitzchak comes up to meet her and the text says he comes from the place where he had been living, a place called Be'er Lahai Ro'i. Now look up Be'er Lahai Ro'i and you'll find out that we don't know exactly where this place is. Some scholars identify Be'er Lahai Ro'i as a, it's a small hidden spring in Southern Jordan. Some people say it's on the Sinai border. Either way, it's not near Hebron and it's not near Beersheba. Yitzchak came down from the mountain and chose to live in a place that was far from both of his parents, far from anything he'd ever known as home, so far away that he can't even make it back for his mother's funeral. He might not even know that she's died. So what is this strange place? And why is Yitzchak there? I wanna ask you to think for a moment about Yitzchak on the top of that mountain, lying beneath the sword's edge. It's in that minute when he sees his father's own moral failings, his willingness to discard the life of his own child, that he thinks, Yitzchak thinks of his own brother, Yishmael, who he hasn't seen since he was a tiny child. In the depths of his own trauma, Yitzchak realizes the pain that his parents brought upon Yishmael and Hagar. And Yitzchak realizes that it wasn't his fault but it was for his own benefit. And he survives that brush with death. He barely survives it, but he survives it. And he knows immediately what he has to do. So immediately after he gets down from that mountain, he doesn't go to Hebron to be with his mother. He doesn't go to Beersheba to be with his father. He goes to Be'er Lahai Ro'i. The only other time we have heard of this place, Be'er Lahai Ro'i is back in Genesis 16, when Hagar and Ishmael are expelled by Sarah and Abraham in the first place, they leave they almost die in the desert, but then they settle in this strange place, Be'er Lahai Ro'i. Hagar named the place, the well, for one who saw me. The well for one who saw me. And that's where Yitzchak goes. He journeys down to see his brother, Ishmael, and he stays there for a long time. There's a big lacuna in our story here. We don't really know what happened when Yitzchak showed up, brokenhearted, trembling, traumatized, awake at his brother's door. But here's what I want to think happened. I'd like to think that those two brothers slowly began to find their way to one another. That day by day, step by step, these brothers peel back the hardened protective layers and open their hearts to each other. That they took responsibility for the mistakes that they have made, that they told the truth about the years of heartache that had kept them apart, that they shared their trauma and their fear, and that when things got really hard between them and the guilt and shame level started to rise, instead of running away, 
I want to believe that those two brothers breathed, that they trusted and that they went back day after day, year after year to sit at the well at which one can be seen until they finally saw each other. And then they found the space to embrace and to forgive and to begin to heal. Both of these two men, Yitzchak and Yishmael, they go on to get married and, and raise families, they have children, but they are changed by the experience of their reconciliation with one another. So much so that when their father Avraham dies soon afterwards, they are able to stand together, not as enemies or combatants or opponents, but as brothers, placing earth over their father's body, laying him to rest with love. In our tradition, Tzchak is often considered the least significant of the Avot. He doesn't have a major character arc like his father or like his son. But Yitzchak is the one who shows us that reconciliation is possible. It's not easy. He has to grow beyond the limits of his parents' generation. Remember, Avraham never does this work. Yeah, Avraham remarries Hagar at the end of our Parsha, at the end of his life. But even still, even in this last chapter of his life, he still privileges his beloved son Yitzchak over all of his other children. He even sends them away again. Look at Genesis 25, echoing the same abuse and neglect of Ishmael that he had perpetrated so many years before. Avraham never gets reconciliation, but Yitzchak does. He has to break away from the many years of trauma. He has to admit that even though his own life was far from easy, he has been the beneficiary of the persecution of another person. Yitzchak has to put the time in to heal. He has to go back to the well again and again. This matters for us so much today because we're living through a time of great pain. This, this chapter of our shared history is so fraught. Surely this is the most polarized time in our country since the Civil War. And it's personal. It's our families. It's our community. You, you can't live through this era and be awake and not experience some kind of trauma. I heard Masha Gessen, the brilliant Masha Gessen yesterday, describe the trauma that we're all living through these past few years. This is what they say. The trauma of watching the abuse of power the trauma for immigrants of being afraid daily, uh, for those of us who are not immigrants, of being somehow complicit in creating that fear, the trauma of the pandemic, and knowing that some people in power see your life and the lives of your loved ones as disposable, the trauma of the response to a call for a reckoning on racism being the fanning of more racism. We cannot go into the future carrying that with us, Masha says. It's unfair painful. It's too much to ask that we just set that aside and continue as though we're going back to some kind of normal. We need a reckoning. And I agree. I agree. I, we need to heal as a nation. But what does it mean to begin to heal? Yitzchak and Yishmael show us that it's possible. And they show us that healing is local and that it's personal and that it's not easy, but it is ours. If you harbor the fantasy of two brothers standing at the graveside, lovingly shoveling earth over the body of their aged father, if you harbor the fantasy of some kind of great national unity, some coming together in the days ahead, remember this, we cannot skip steps. In Pirkei Avot, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says that on three things the world stands: al shlosha devarim haolam omed, al hadin, ve'al haemet, ve'al hashalom, on justice, on truth, and on peace. We cannot get to peace, to shalom, if we bypass justice and truth. There is no shortcut. We can't get to peace if we wait for someone else to do that work for us. We can't get to peace by silencing the wrongs that have been committed and pretending that they did not happen. I desperately wanna to move to the next chapter. 
I desperately want to believe that we can move forward from this incredible turmoil, needlessly, selfishly, recklessly stoked over the past several years for political gain towards some kind of shared narrative and shared future for all of us. And I know that reconciliation is possible even after terrible pain and trauma. But we can't heal without talking honestly about what has been revealed to us over the last several years, about what we have all been through, about what sits at the foundation of this nation. We can't heal without a clear-headed assessment without an honest diagnosis of the sickness that is the underlying condition of this country. And we cannot heal without a true shared investment in the treatment that will help us heal. In the days ahead, I hope and I pray that we're going to have the chance to do that work, that holy work. And I hope and I pray that like these two brothers thousands of years ago, we will be able to overcome the incredible rifts that have torn and are tearing this family apart. And I hope and I pray that we will be able to come together to lay the past to rest and finally build a new and a better future for all of us. I wish you Shabbat Shalom.